Hey everyone, welcome back to another one of these things. I'm here today taking over Erica's office in the church. And I'm taking over the office because this is where we hold a whole bunch of art supplies in the church. One of the things that we've been doing recently that's been a bit of fun for us here at the church is we've been making these chalk, I don't know what to call them, art pieces. And I don't know if you're taking confessions, but here's our confession is that none of us is a real artist. We just trace these. So we have a projector and we put it on the wall and outline it with chalk. This one has been staring at me in my office for the past week and a bit or so. And I thought today we would talk a little bit about Abraham, this dude here, and Isaac, this guy here. And I should say to you that I'm pretty sure Peter is talking something about Abraham and Isaac in the sermon this week. So if I steal his thunder, uh, just that won't happen. Don't worry about it. The Abraham and Isaac story is a unique story in the scriptures that has captured a lot of Jewish and Christian imagination over the years. Uh, in fact, it's one of the few passages in scripture that has its own name. In the Jewish tradition, Genesis 22, where we see Abraham and Isaac is called the Akedah, which means the binding. And the story just briefly goes like this. Abraham hears from God. He's going to be given a test. He says, take your son Isaac up onto a mountain that's a three-day journey away and there sacrifice him to me. And if you are a modern person and even if you are an ancient person, that should be an objectionable command. Just for a little bit of context, though, if it helps any. Um, sacrificing your firstborn was not an unheard of practice at the time. I am also a firstborn, so I'm not in favor of this practice for a whole bunch of reasons. But at the time, if you were to do that, that would mean that your family or your village is in grave danger and you need to give the very best that you've got to show that you're not in this for yourself, but you are thinking of the wider community. Not that that makes the practice any better. Abraham hears from God, and then he takes Isaac and his servants and they head out towards the mountain. And here's the question that maybe at least I want to ask at this point is let's imagine Abraham is living in a subdivision and he hears from God at night and he's going to go in the morning and the neighbor wakes up and the neighbor's getting in his car going to work and Abraham's putting Isaac in the Jeep or whatever the case may be. And the neighbor says, where are you off to and what are you doing? Can Abraham use just like pure human only logic and understanding and reason to explain to the neighbor what the heck is going on such that the neighbor would not call the police. And I'm going to suggest to you that, no, he can't. Can Abraham, even in the text, he doesn't tell his wife, can Abraham explain to his wife why it is right for him to take Isaac to the mountain and sacrifice him? And probably same deal. No, he cannot articulate it clearly. Does Abraham, like, have his own doubts? Does he have his own worries? Well, the text actually doesn't say. It just says, God said, and then Abraham went. And in the New Testament, we hear from one of the writers there that, in fact, Abraham had faith that even God can bring Isaac back from the dead. So Abraham wasn't too shaken. Uh, he had a knowledge, but it was a knowledge that he couldn't express or convey to others. And I'd like to suggest to us that that is, for many of us, our experience of Christian faith. I'm going to put this down for a second. In the Christian life, we don't imitate Abraham in that we, you know, kill our firstborns. Just, it's abhorrent, obviously, don't do that. But we do imitate Abraham, and he's held up in Scripture as an image of one who knew something because of the faith that they had. And in the Christian life, this is our confession that faith isn't necessarily blind. Faith isn't ignorance. Faith is a knowledge of things that is just not, I'm going to say, empirical. And what I mean by empirical is that you can write it out, you can test it, you can poke it, you can give it to your next door neighbor, and they would say, yep, yeah, that makes sense. If we are living the Christian life the way it is supposed to be lived, people from the outside should be looking at us and saying, I don't understand where these people are getting their information. I don't understand how these people are thinking. 
They are foreign and they are different from me. And the reason I want to bring this to you today is if in your Christian life, you feel like you are the odd one out, you're ostracized, people kind of take jabs at you and say that your beliefs are silly, that you are um, somehow less smart than everyone else. I just want to say to you, look to the example of Abraham, look to the New Testament writers, and we see plain and clear in the text of Scripture that faith is an understanding. You know that you know, but it's not the type of understanding that human words and human logic can convey to others. Others will come and see Jesus Christ as he himself reveals his love and his grace to them. And at that point, they will see that the Christian life is not a bunch of folly, but it's wisdom provided from God. I hope that's a little bit of encouragement for you guys. You are, well, you're probably a little bit weird, but you're not weird because of your faith. The truth is that just your faith is unintelligible at this point to those around you looking in. And as they become Christians, they will see what we already know. Thanks, everyone, and we'll catch you next week.